Welcome to episode 8 of the Heart Podcast, everyone. This is our final episode of the season. In today's episode, we focus on community engagement and anti-racist teaching. What's exciting is that all of our guests, including our fabulous students, are involved in community outreach and working with youth. Throughout our conversation, we will be hearing about how their community work informs the way they approach anti-racist teaching. In addition, we'll hear about how and why they teach and engage in the work that they do. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pawgusset, and Nipmuc peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Thank you, Omar. It's hard to believe we're now in our last episode for season one of the Heart Podcast. It has been an incredible journey, and we're thrilled to be closing our season with our guests today with a focus on community engagement as part of anti-racist teaching. Joining us today is Dr. Danielle Filipiak, who is an assistant professor of curriculum and instruction at the University of Connecticut. Her research and areas of expertise include civic learning and critical digital literacy, in addition to identity construction of urban school administrators and academic achievement. Also joining us today is Dr. Johnny Ramirez, who is a postdoc fellow with the Interdisciplinary Research Incubator for the Study of Inequality and a faculty member at the University of Denver. His research interests span the areas of Chicanx and Latinx school pushout, youth resistance, positive youth development, and also he possesses a deep passion for community-engaged research and critical pedagogical approaches. We're also excited to introduce Marisa Martinez Suarez, who is a first-year, first-generation college student and an emerging student leader who is interested in ethnic studies, community-engaged research, and student activism. In addition, we have Brianna Aguilar. She's joining us as a fourth-year student, also from the University of Denver, a first-generation college student, and she serves as a chair of the Latinx Student Alliance at the University of Denver. We are so grateful for you all joining us today and look forward to learning from you during our conversation. Danielle, can you get us started on the conversation today by sharing with us how your work with communities and youth in particular inform how you approach your teaching and what that looks like in your classroom? Sure. It's there's like I feel like we could talk <laughs> I could talk about this all day, right? Into to, to, yeah, forever. <laughs> such like it's such um it's work, you know, and it's it's not about even a product. Like sometimes we think that we're going to like all of a sudden at the end of 15 weeks in the semester that like everybody's going to be woke, you know, or you have these predetermined outcomes, <laughs> right? But really it's about this process and it's very um it's also a spiritual process, right? And we a lot of times we like to put our, you know, I think especially in teacher preparation we're really guided by like program goals and outcomes and so on and so forth that and, and kind of like this neoliberal agenda around like, you know, um, producing numbers, right? Um, but as for me and my work with communities for and young people for almost 20 years now, um, something I've been thinking a lot about is just thinking about um, creating, you know, pathways between, you know, young people's desires especially in this specific historical and sociopolitical moment, right? And, and that desires, I, I'm also drawing on the language of like Eve Tuck, when she talks about focusing on like the desires of, of young people instead of this, these damage-centered frameworks and seeing young people as broken, right, all the time. Um, so really trying to think about like what shows up in these spaces where all of us have been working with young people for several years, you know, what desires exist there. Um, and then what I'm thinking about in the pre-service classroom, which is definitely like a transition, right? From working in these community spaces to like working with pre-service teachers. Um, I think there's such a tendency, especially in lieu of these hyper accountability and uh, in lieu of these hyper accountability measures and hyper standardization to keep plugging along, right? And not imagine you know, how things might be otherwise um, to, to talk about like Maxine Green's notion of social imagination. Um, so for instance, in my work with Cypress for, for Justice, which is a um, New York City based um, youth development program that apprentices youth 
through um, youth and pre-service teachers, actually, as critical social researchers um, through the development of critical social research methods, um, as well as cultural and multiple literacies um, like hip hop and spoken word, I realized in my work there that this focus on expression and young people being able to exist fully as they are, right, really was important for them, right? Um, it's not always what comes out, right? So I've been engaged in this, this youth research work for a while and young people have explored things like the school, prison, school to prison pipeline and dehumanizing curriculums and so on and so forth. But it's also about like the epistemology, right? And, I, and, and identity work and young people being able to, to, to share that, right? In a space that feels safe. Um, and so for me, like translating that into the pre-service classroom, really holding space for that. Um, I got to ask you, Danielle, actually, you just look, you're like, yes, I want to know about that. I feel like you're, 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 you're navigating or bringing together two different worlds. I feel like yeah. there's the community on the ground youth work that you're talking about, this free expression where youth can like just be and then you're talking about pre-service classrooms and if right. you, every time you say it you you sound like a uh, constraint is in your voice when you're saying pre-service pre so i want to know what happens in your classroom like how do you bring those two things together yeah so so like for instance in thinking about all this work because i'm also simultaneously trying to create a context so you kind of understand a little bit about what i've done right um so just like, for instance, in my pre-service class in multicultural lab, when I was really thinking about at the time, um, all of this multiple literacy stuff, I invited in like, you know, a hip hop facilitator, like, okay, let's bring these, let's bring these community teaching artists in, right? Let's think about what this looks like. Like, how can you do this in your own classroom, right? Um, so that they can really understand firsthand, like what it actually feels like in their own bodies, right? um to engage in these you know to engage in this work right and, and authentically valuing these cultural and uh, multiple literacies so i think this like ability to like specifically change the ways we teach right um so that we're inviting the identities and literacies of young people into the classroom right creating those methods um authentically can shift discourses because the ways that and and the ways that we come to interact with each other, part of the reason that racism exists is because for some people who are very privileged, it feels largely invisible, right? Um, and it's 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 hard to dismantle. But I think it's important to think about ways to disrupt schooling to account for these, you know, literacies and identities, um, and, and put them front and center, so that the desires and understandings of young people are, you know, do come first. So I think pre-service teachers need to be able to experience that. And so that's those are some of the things that I've been thinking about is inviting, you know, opportunities for, for teachers to engage some of those methods in those multiple and, and, and cultural literacies. That's one way. Yeah, I have a feeling that you have like a hundred other ways that you do this. So I appreciate that you're like giving us a little snippet. And what I'm hearing deeply in what you just shared, um, Danielle, is that it seems like there's a really strong commitment for the desires of young people to be what is driving learning in the classroom. And I'm curious how your pre-service teachers respond to that type of commitment that you're evoking through how you're teaching. I think it's exciting in some ways, but we're careful not to fetishize, right? A lot of times this stuff is made as like the side dish. You know, but the question always becomes about like, but what about standardized English? But what if my school administrator doesn't let me do this? And so I think the work of like these lenses, these these lenses of history, right? Having pre-service teachers understand like the roots of the historical roots of racism and getting that knowledge paired with what they're like, they need to multiple ways to connect with this understanding that this is not a side dish. <laughs> Like this is should be at the center of what we're trying to do. So not just engaging and fetishizing young people, but understanding the ways in which, you know, this this is this is work that can be powerful and liberating. This is what we should be doing every day and we should be making the case for. So sometimes there's tensions. 
Um, but I don't, and I think that's what makes it so hard for us as pre-service educators. Sometimes you do the work and you're not sure what the impact or result is going to be, right? But you do it anyways because you're planting seeds with hopes that later on down the road, that pre-service teacher will remember that moment or experience and return back to it, you know? Yeah, thank you for that. Johnny, what are your thoughts about how your community work, you know, um, shapes the way you go about teaching now? Cool. Thank you, Milagros. And thank you, Danielle, just for sharing that too. You got the wheels turning too about really like reflecting on kind of like two different contexts. Like when we're in community space and we're able to meet young people in their places where they want to be and you don't have the heaviness of these schooling structures and these institutions that in place all these rules and regulations, kind of almost like a policing of how to be, it's a whole different dynamic that occurs. And I think for me, that's been one of the things that have been a blessing or strength of doing youth event intervention work for, you know, for, for also over 20 years too, was starting off where my journey of working with young people was really about kind of this framework of meeting them where they were at. I started off in some youth intervention programs that focused on gang and in, in, uh, gang involved youth or gang affiliated youth, but it was also really dealing with young folks that were just struggling in the community as well. Youth that have been pushed out of school, uh, you know, teen parents, right? Like a, a, a lot of different young folks that just needed support. They needed a space to feel like, you know, connected to, uh, to feel um, in many ways, I guess, to use the scholarly lingo, humanized in spaces where a bit of their humanity and who they are were being kind of attacked. So I think in many ways that kind of guided a lot of meeting young people where they're at, learning their stories and really focusing on developing relationship and trust. And one of the biggest takeaways was that wasn't going to be given immediately. That's where I think a lot of folks in academia, when they talk about some like community engaged work or working in partnership with community, that there has to be a, a measure of time spent and where community can kind of begin to see who you are and then begin to see if your actions represent those values or are you just being kind of a drive by researcher or you're only here because of this grant or if you're only here because it's your job. So that's kind of like, I think a big thing for me was that. So what I bring, I think in my teaching, bringing in that work as a youth worker and as a youth organizer is I try to meet my students where they're at. You know, uh, literally, like in many ways, I think of my classroom as kind of like a community space. I call it a classroom community where I'm trying to really evoke that essence that we're sitting in a big circle, even though it's hard virtually at times, but that everyone's going to be seen and everyone's going to be acknowledged. And I think a lot of my practice and this work has even kind of like took a whole other dimension now that I'm at a private predominantly white institution where I have a lot of white students and I'm trying to shape and kind of put this pedagogy to figure out where I could meet them at a place. Because the whole, I guess, kind of framework is meeting our youth in our community where they're at is the first step. And then seeing if they're willing to walk with you in terms of post personal growth, in terms of like expanding their consciousness or maybe picking up some tools, that's a whole other step. But I feel like my first initial step is to meet where folks are at with no judgment or anything, of course, understanding context but just really trying to acknowledge their humanity. And um, being one of the pilot professors here in the critical race and ethnic studies minor, I've been one of the first professors to kind of teach with this like pedagogical approach that really is grounding in community, but then I think also kind of grounding in um, bringing in those, um, how can I say like, like uh, frameworks and lenses that anchor itself like in, in indigeneity or anchors itself in like, what is it to have this platica? Like what it is to bring our community and our family spaces into these institutions. And again, it's a, it's, it's little sparks. It's here or there. And it doesn't like, sometimes, you know, you have your moments where it feels like traditional space, but the intention all the time, I think that I approach is to not make it feel like this is a regular class or this is a regular space and trying to be very upfront with that, with my students, when we first open up class and I, I and I kind of model what it is to kind of share a bit of my authentic self my testimonial. So I kind of bring it there and then I give it to the students to see if that reciprocity and if they're in a place where they can do it. And believe me, I've had the in classroom engagement with my students that have been very open and they've shared their story, their healing journey, their traumas. But then sometimes it happens in office hours too, you know, and which is amazing as well to be able to have those connections. Because again, we're talking about context. We're talking about doing work that goes directly against what these institutions are designed to do. 
you know? So I think I kind of come with a bit of that like framework and sensibility and being definitely a, a student of ethnic studies, my master's in Chicano studies, my PhD in education with race and ethnic studies and then all the community work, I've been blessed to kind of really ground my identity as an activist scholar to bring those with me. And, and again, Danielle, like you said, I think it, it, it could be con contentious in different spaces. I could be read in so many different ways, either by my students or by the administration of like, who is this guy? He's radical. Or who is this guy? He's only for students of color or, you know, whatever. And I've kind of heard a bit of those critiques, but I also know that, that the work that I'm doing is being impactful because students have shared that with me. Students, I, I'm, I'm co-constructing classes and trying to create space with them. And I think it's been a journey because I think I'm still learning that kind of craft of how much community I could bring in and then how much are the students willing to also kind of like be a part of that process and then see what we could do together. Yeah, yeah John. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> like that was uh, powerful, powerful, Johnny. And you were going to bring it <laughs> um, because your soul, what I hear you saying is your soul is intact. You know, like everything you do is the same, whether you're doing it in the community organizing space or in the classroom, because right. you're bringing soul work to the work. Your mm -hmm. intention's the same is to meet people. And when you say, when I'm hearing you say like me students where they're at, I think you're, you're saying to the effect of like, wherever they are in their own humanity, in their own human experience, in their own lived experiences, meeting them there, and then seeing where they want to go and can go and want to go in terms of their, um, you know, transformation of consciousness, and then putting that consciousness to to work, right, to create change wherever they choose to to create that change. So I feel like that's really powerful. And something uh, you raised also, I want to ask you to elaborate on is. Um, you mentioned that this is the first time you're kind of doing it in a predominantly white space, you know, in a private institution. And mm -hmm. I'm curious about how you stay intact or mm -hmm. how you approach your teaching so that it stays intact, mm -hmm. given that context. Like, what, what does that look like for you? Yeah, th thank you, Milagros. I think what's really kind of, an, and I've heard this from other uh, like amazing colleagues that kind of do this work too, is that, you know, the students hold me down <laughs> a lot of times because, you know, I've used this phrase with some of the student activist group. So there's a student activist group at DU called RAR, Righteous Anger Healing Resistance. And in that group in particular, it's almost like the, the saying that I passed on to them was something I learned growing up, like being in neighborhoods was, you know, somos pocos, pero locos. We might be small, but we could get crazy. Like we could do, we could do some work, right? So a lot of times that vibe, I feel that vibe when I'm leaning on my students or different uh, uh, allies that are uh, tenured faculty come around and do that check-in and kind of see like how things are going. But ultimately I think it was about building community with students, with faculty and with staff and having times where we could come together for either an event or like some meetings. And with those RAR students, it was about us having some Sunday meetings. We just recently had one. We had, uh, it was like, a, uh, we all were masked up. We were at a park. It was about like 77 degrees. And we all just did basically kind of like uh, pulling a page from the healing resistance and activism work. We did a total check-in, where are folks at? How are they feeling? What are some next steps for either the summer or if you're graduating, what might be your next steps? How can we support you? And then the very last 15 minutes, was kind of like, these are some ideas of what, how we want to pass the work on to next year and stuff. And at that moment, I thought, wow, like, look at this community that kind of like grew out of a bit of like activism, but then now is starting to feel more just like a, a, a community where there's a sense of connection and a sense of restoration that we're, that it's the community care piece is what I'm getting at. And I, and I think it, in, in a, in a way, uh, maybe being in a private predominantly white institution that oftentimes hostile and all that, it kind of helps in terms of like really uh, 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 pushing us to connect and not let ourselves be siloed and be divided around a whole bunch of things that we're able on, on a Sunday to make time for one and to be able to come and link up. And if we would have had our phones up, we would have had probably like three other people sitting on the phone call too with us at the park. So I hope that I hope that kind of answers your question. But I, I, I really do think that uh, being in this context, like even those lines of like, 
you know, of course, as faculty, there's so much privilege. I have my education, I have a salary, I got medical benefit. You know, I know it's in a different context but of, of students, but when it comes to dealing with all the, the, the excuse my language, but the of white supremacy and colonization there that it many times is overt, we have to look to each other for that support and sense of community. And that would just be one of the messages because I was told early on, well, if you do that, you're not going to be, if you have two uh, strong relationships with students, it's going to be a backlash. You're not going to seen as a serious professional. You're not a doctoral student anymore. You're a professor now. You've got to like kind of take up this posturing or whatever. And I'm looking at them going, well, first of all, that ain't me. And second of all, I've been doing what I've been doing and it got me here now. So of course there has to be healthy relationship boundaries that might be there. But the fact that I can't see myself in community with my students, their community, their family, their relationship is like, that, that's, that, that goes against, that's an antithesis to how I do this work. It's, you know, you know what I mean? Like if I wanna be able to show up authentically and connect with folks, I'm thinking the students, if they wanna build in the same way, we should be able to do that. Thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Johnny. Very, very powerful. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I got to say that as I as I was listening to Danielle and, and Johnny uh, share their thoughts, I, I couldn't help but be uh, reminded of my former mentors and teachers that I've had along the way that that have given me that sense of humanity um, when I, I haven't been able to find that in other communities before. You know, there's this um, there's this sense in like students of mixed status that like you're neither from here nor there. You know, I, I I moved to the United States when I was a little over a year old. And so I just know Mexico through pictures and videos and stories. And yet I'm in a country that doesn't quite accept me, you know. And so what you were sharing, Johnny, just really spoke to me because of that reason, you know, where it's like you can you can find home in in people, in communities. And and it's incredible the the power that it gives to the students or the individuals involved in those communities to hopefully create a, a positive chain of events where they will help other people and then you know they will help others and it's just a beautiful chain of events but i'm, I'm really curious to hear uh from from brianna and and marisa um just it, it it sounds like you are both incredibly involved and you're both very passionate and so i'm just curious to hear where did that come from um exactly so if you could share about where maybe the genesis was of your interests and your passions and and what brought you to do the work that you do currently personally my first two years at du i was a commuter student so that alone i already felt more isolated from the community but i wasn't aware of all the stuff that was going down at du like johnny said all the f that would go down in terms of what du was doing to its students of color and to students who are underrepresented here in general um there was a hate email sent out there's just so much going on in terms of how they're like all these our white counterparts you know get away with and i didn't know anyone really until my second year once i started seeing the protests and the rallies on campus and i was like oh you know I, there are some like students here that are actually you know fighting back on this and like i just wanted to help i've always been a person who loves helping the community loves helping now and especially because it was such a hard time for me being on campus that you know these student leaders would come to me and be like hi like what's your name and be welcoming more than the university welcome me itself and you know even though it wasn't the funnest context to kind of meet them at these protests and rallies it's really what brought me in to see you know such hard working individuals and you know they didn't have to be doing this type of work but when i started seeing that no one else was going to do it so that's why they're doing it and you know just trying to help other students like us feel like they belong on campus it really gave me that drive and passion as well to realize that you know hey i do belong here and i have my voice i'm a student here as well you know i shouldn't just feel like i'm isolated or that i don't matter and once i st started hearing like everyone else's stories and connecting the thoughts of like hey you're not the only you know student of color in that class either me too like you know i just had so many experiences of like feeling annihilated in class there was a moment where my first class i ever took on campus uh it was a full 100 student class and the th three seats next to me remained empty for the first few weeks i didn't know why i i was like yo do i smell like what's going on here and they would get chairs and move it to the front but 
purposely like those three seats just remained empty and I it felt like what did I do wrong what is going on here and I was the only student of color in that class um the only woman of color in that class so it felt annihilating of like wow like no one really doesn't want to talk to me and then you know when these professors are tell the students like let's go into groups let's talk I always feel like I, I'm looked down upon as like, oh, she's just the token child that got in for the university, right? They don't really actually know that I, I am smart. I do know what I'm doing. And it always made me question my own intelligence of like, oh, maybe I shouldn't speak up or I shouldn't say anything. Um, and on, on top of that, it's just there's been more experience where one time in class there, I don't know how we got into the topic about what our parents do as jobs, but like these students, all my white counterparts were talking about my dad's the manager, the business CEO, all these things. And it came to me and I was like, um, oh, my dad is undocumented and my mom is like a cashier supervisor for a small company that does, you know, catering. <laughs> and at first I was kind of embarrassed because I was like, why is even the teacher allowing this still? Or like, why are we doing this? But like at the end of the day, this moment, this spark was like, you know, all their parents, you know, they got all this handed to them, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm still in the seat in the same room as them. And if anything, on a full ride versus where their parents pay for them to, you know, get into there and like, you know, I worked my ass off. I know I have. And really, that's really what brought me to this type of work to not only help the community but also empower students you know who felt that same way of isolation annihilation from you know in these classes because like johnny said it's a predominantly white institute and you it is like it, it's hard being in these classes where i feel like i have to wear a mask or you know switch switch up and like not show up as myself i always feel like okay well i have to come in this way be on my smartest be on like you know my my top notch of like oh, hi my name is like no and like after a while, like just being able to be involved with student leadership, that's where I started to feel at home. That's where I started to feel like I have a voice, I have power. And like, you know, now I I, I won't be quiet now. Like <laughs> I'm definitely the individual where I'm like, y'all need me? Where do y'all need me? You know, I got this voice for a reason. I'll like, I don't care if you need me to yell, if you need me to preach, I don't care. Like <laughs> I am not shy anymore. I am not scared anymore or intimidated by this university or just these institutions in general and you know just calling it out as it is and helping the communities that you know again need it and it's an important line of work thank you so much brianna marisa would you like to go ahead yeah so um my work took like a different pathway than brianna's um i mine started like my junior year summer when i took a course on the history of education and how it's like where it started and who was allowed an education who wasn't allowed an education and it was in that moment where I really started to reflect like I feel like I was so numb to the point where I just accepted my curriculum to be what it was and I when I saw that I realized what I deserved and it was like such a moment of realization I was like why is it that I'm basically 17 by this point and I've never heard the stories of the Chicana and the Chicano walkouts why is it that I've never heard about all these leaders in my community. And I guess I just had gotten to the point where I didn't even think that like Latinos could be leaders. And I know that sounds so like not true, but like at that moment I was in that stage of my life where I just, I didn't see those like points of representation. And once I saw it, I felt kind of like cheated and I felt like robbed from my history. And I just sort of reflect like, there are so many kids that deal with issues of identity. Like for me, like I, I related to what you said, like I was growing up in this atmosphere where my grandma would be calling me a gringa, but my documentation status would not be saying the same thing. And it just, I know there are so many students who like deal with those issues of identity and just having that space to heal as Prof. Johnny says, like it really makes an impact. Like when I'm in Prof. Johnny's class, like he tells us like, if you see any way that like, the content that you're learning like relates to you speak on that and heal from that and like also realize that like the like the experience that you experiences that you've lived through like those are lessons within themselves so in a way like whatever i learn in like in class i also learn it within myself and i feel like that's what i don't get from some of my other classes is that is that they don't show me like how it relates back to me and since then like my work just goes around like making sure that kids have that representation and also have that space to heal. And I'm really early in my journey, but like um, just like these pivotal points in my lifetime where I've been like exposed to like what I deserve 
has really taught me a lot of what I want to give back to my community. I mean, what the two of you just shared is, you know, both the way education can deplete us when it's not nurturing who we are, what our cultures are about, you know, what what is possible within our own communities. And then you also both shared, you know, how powerful it could be when you do have the opportunity to be in classrooms where you are being nurtured, where you are getting exposure to the way in which there's beautiful, uh, amazing skills, knowledge, and wisdom within your own cultures and communities. And then what you could do with that, because once you have that voice, like you were saying, Brianna, you can put it into work and into action to uplift other people. And that's that's super powerful. Um, I, I wanna ask Danielle and Johnny, kind of like your reactions to what you heard and like, how, how do you see it connect? Um, particularly to this one thing, like, Everyone's bringing up these complex issues, like interlocking systems of oppression that shape experiences. It's not like one identity, but like the the whole system at play. I, I'm curious your response to what you just heard and curious about how you potentially bring that intersectional lens into your own anti-racist teaching. Danielle, you want to weigh in or Johnny, either one? I'm like just processing all this, all of this, honestly. Um... I mean, this is the work, right? Like, this is a space where also, like, this intergenerational space where we're able to build upon each other, this notion of relationality is so crucial. I mean, even just to go back to what Johnny was saying, like, this ability to sustain yourself in these systems is so much about, you know, being able to build community and to be able to dialogue that like this and come together. Um, I don't even remember what the question is, but I'm just like, this is where it's going. You remind me a lot of, um, and I, I've spoken of her a lot. I've spent some time in her living room um, of Grace Boggs, who talks about this idea that like, you can't change any society unless you feel responsibility for it. And unless you see yourself as belonging to it and responsible for changing it. So what you all as young people, you know, Marissa and Brianna, I just feel so inspired by your words and just kind of going back to this notion of like dignity and belonging um, and also this sense of agency. And I think that our ability as teachers and my ability and but all of us thinking about like, when I hear Johnny talking about his work and with you all as well, making sure that this classroom space, this, this pre-service space, Acknowledges how, how important these notions of belonging and agency are. That it's not always just about like, let's just get through this, meet these standards, but like, let me model for you what this idea of belonging looks like. Let me model, let me give you opportunities to see how this work can be transformative for communities. And if we're not doing that in our classrooms, and there's times I've been called out. You know, oh, yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. This is a hard space. Like this is a bit I have been so humbled by my experience here at UConn because it's a very different context than New York City and Detroit, right? And so you're working with all kinds of identities and all different people's ideas of what social justice teaching looks like. But what you are again reminding me is just how important it is to um that like the revolution is attached to making sure young people feel like they belong. And also feel like there's pathways to be able to do something about these systems that exist and that there is possibility and hope and disruption. You, you know, Danielle, too, and, and I wanted to build on something that was like, like, kind of like clicked a little like light in my thinking, too. When you early talked about kind of like, like in this work, sometimes there's always like a push for the outcome, the numbers, um, like kind of community work, the sign in sheet, how big, how many people attended where. And and in and in it and as educator professors, um, you know the the push is well, how rigorous was it? Uh, did the students like how many assignments? What was their points? But that's that's one part of it. But I think what gets lost in all that is the process to get that. And I think through the years, that's a big point of of my growth in an area where I think as a young organizer and a young uh, person doing this work, I was always about the outcome. How big could we get this event? How crazy could we get taking over city hall or, or going into the chancellor's office or whatever? I was kind of that driven on the outcome piece. But if you really sustain this work, 
you recognize that the power, the transport is in the process. It's actually in the journey. Yes, you always want that po positive, impactful outcome. But if we're hurting each other or causing each other harm or silencing each other and dehumanizing on the way to get there, then then really are we doing like are we really honoring the work and our ancestors are like like no. And if you do, if you're a student of social movement history and those type of organizings, unfortunately, some of those organizing spaces and movement building spaces were some of the more toxic spaces that were there for women, for LGBTQ plus folks, right? Like it, it's, it's, you know, so I think I bring a bit of that sensibility. I'm all about process. I think like when I come in and I open up space with folks, I'm, I guess, ready to share a bit of my story, a bit of my testimonial, but then also show some examples that motivate my intentional work. So one of the things I share with the students is a documentary called Precious Knowledge that outline that kind of, yeah, that 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 talks about the Mexican American studies um, uh, uh, fight at Tucson Unified School District in Arizona, how the research was indicating that students were achieving like higher test scores. There was an increase in uh, uh, Chicanx, Latinx uh, graduation rates, like all this good stuff. And then of course, racism, the structure, it all comes and they shut it down. And then it shows the students mobilize with their family, embracing their indigeneity and, and, and move forward into a movement to fight for, for their education for the future generations. Um, that piece is very intentional when I share with my students. And I think that and the, uh, and the nod to in la quech, tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me, that kind of Mayan indigenous philosophy that kind of, again, when we think about all of our identities and how we could show up I think at that discussion is just a recognition of our humanity, I think at first, and then we build that our humanity is those identities as well. We bring those with us and can we create a space where we could show up and see one another and acknowledge one another and validate one another. And again, that's bumpy work. That doesn't, those spaces sometimes, what I would kind of call sacred spaces, they don't happen all the time, whether in community or in university. But I've been blessed and to have certain moments where that's happened. And I would say, I don't know if, if Brianna and Maritza would agree, but that fall quarter, the recent, um, her story, our story, uh, her story, his story, our story, Ch uh, Chicanx, Latinx, student resistant and activism, I think was the closest to me feeling like we were really having Chicano, Chicana studies at, at DU because it was majority of students of color. We had so many student leaders and organizers and there was a big shift in the course. And um, and I feel like and again, those are intentions, but they don't happen unless the students feel that connection and that they feel like it's their space to be able to do so. Johnny, I could I could add to that. Yeah. Like, I think earlier someone mentioned that, like what it's like to even be in one of Johnny's classes. And really, honestly, I didn't take one of Johnny's classes until my third year. And that was when COVID had began. So it had to be like online. And that was my first time. But honestly like on on campus all of my classes i i dreaded going to them i was never feeling comfortable and i always felt like on the edge or anxious going to these classes but when i come to johnny's class i feel like i could let my guard down and be myself like it makes me want to cry low-key because you think for an institution that likes to advocate diversity and inclusive right. inclusive right. excellence and you know they cost more than harvard but i'm i'm not feeling like you know the product of that um, but going to Johnny's class, I never, I, I was always was a smile. I always was like, well, I'm going to wake up on time for this, you know? And actually, like, I didn't feel nervous to raise my hand and to actually, like, engage with the class. Every time I left Johnny's class, it felt like I actually got something out of it every day. And not only just felt like, oh, a robot, like, let me just turn in this paper, let me turn in this assignment. No, it was actually personal and a, a good self development to myself and to the community in general. And I really just, it makes me frustrated that it took that long. And that there's not a lot of classes like like Johnny's and like I really do think that like the reason why like a, a lot like our community loves Johnny in general like his, his teachings again like he says like you know Johnny shows up as himself too that made me feel like all right like he's being real you know my teacher listens to the same type of music I listen to finally like it feels like I'm at home I didn't leave my parents as a first gen student too you know like oh finally someone gets it or someone's trying to get it and it, it makes me you know 
sad to realize there's professors who are like, well, this has to be a professional, like you, you call me by, you know, Dr. Da da da, And like, I'm like, okay, that's cool. But you're never going to get to your students that way. I'm trying to act like, you know, you have this role, you have this title, this authority. Cool. That, but that honestly, that pushes me away from professors here on campus and just in general, like, I'm like, you're not even trying to get to know me. Johnny's at the Garden of Sas. Johnny's there. Like, that's how that and that makes me want to be more engaged. That makes me want to take more of his classes that makes me feel like i'm actually getting my education like at the end of the day um i could only really say that most of the things i really am learning have been from taking johnny's classes and that was towards the end of my third year up until this point and my first two years it feels like a blur i don't really remember much material again most of the professors here are just more like you give us our product there you go it's kind of like that capitalist structure of like we do this work our labor you grade it cool on to the next set of 100 students we got to teach versus johnny it's like you know my first name you know my my prima my tias all this stuff and he's trying he's actually trying to build that connection with students and then again not everyone is that that same way of like oh i like it takes a minute and i like johnny said like it's like a lot of these professors too want to come in and think that you know we could just trust them right away or that you know we just need to like believe in them and just go in and like have faith that you know they're gonna do us right but like really i, I appreciate johnny's like patience and always you know letting us know that hey if there's anything i'm doing wrong let me know or hey what do y'all want to talk about today johnny never ignored the outside issues that were happening outside of classes versus other classrooms it was always like okay we're just gonna next slide lecture da 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 there, did you not just hear about the mass shooting that happened did you not just hear about the police brutality that's happening you're not gonna address that you're not gonna talk like you're just gonna act like we come to this classroom and everything's gone you know of course my white counterparts have the privilege of doing that but i'm sitting here thinking oh my goodness like what's next like and all these thoughts run through my head versus these other professors again i i don't feel comfortable or like, you know, going up to them being like, hey, can I get an extension on this paper? You know, I'm planning this huge pro to these like events and stuff like that. I'm, I'm doing the dirty work of DU for diversity recruitment, basically. And versus Johnny, I could, I feel comfortable letting him know like, hey, can I please get like, and it was always because he knows he sees it and he's there versus other professors. They're not there. They're not even here in the community. They're just here to, you know, teach the 100 students they got to teach and then they leave. They just dip out and leave and they don't build that connection. They keep it like Johnny said that that professionalism, which it's I, I respect, right? But also there's a line of that's how you're never gonna be able to connect with us and really build that community with us. Thank you so much for for sharing, Brianna. It's really, really powerful. And and um I, I really I, I appreciate all of us, you know, being vulnerable. I think um Johnny, to to build off of one of the points that you made that that really stuck with me is that you know, you you had mentioned that. Oftentimes in this work, people forget about the process. Um, in addition to that, I, I feel like people don't create sustainable systems also. You know, sometimes really great initiatives happen once. That's great. And then they disappear because no one's leading that initiative. And I think you and Danielle are not only facilitating a better process, but you're also creating sustainability. And Brianna and Marissa are the example of sustainability. You are teaching them, you are giving them the tools, you are giving them the voice so that they can one day be a Johnny, be a Daniel, be a Milagros, you know? And I think that's super, super powerful. So kudos to all of you. Um, I'd, I'd really love to hear uh, from, from Marisa and, you know, just, I'd really love to get your perspective on, you know, when we think of professors and we think of creating powerful anti-racist teaching education, what is it that you think of Marisa or who do you think of? Yeah, um, so when I took the class with Prof. Johnny, it came at like, I feel just the right time because it was during my first quarter at DU and all my other classes, like Brianna said, like in high school, I went to a school that was like predominantly like 80% Latinx and now I go into the school where I'm like the only one in my classroom and my teachers definitely made me feel that like, even if they cared, they would microaggress me like so bad and sometimes like unintentionally like with no like malicious intent but like they just couldn't relate to my experiences and when I like look up over Johnny like the first thing that he does when we enter a class is that he tells us his story his testimonial and he lets us know like this is what I had to do to get here and like know that like my family I come from a family that's also like first generation like all of this and like he really like lets it all out and from there I can see that like 
I can relate to him in a way that I can't relate to any of my other professors. Because my other professors, like, I'm not sure if they were also first generation students or if they also went through the same struggles. But Prof. Johnny really lets me know that, like, you're not alone. And, like, if you're, like, struggling right now, like, it doesn't have to be like that. And I don't feel like I get that from my other professors in the same way. And sometimes, like, when I reach out to my professors and I'm struggling, I kind of feel like a burden. And I don't know, like, I know that sounds bad, but I don't know. Sometimes, like, you're scared to reach out because there are those, like, hierarchical relationships with teachers that, like, I'm the one who carries the knowledge and I'm just giving it to you. And I don't know, it just, it comes off so like wrong and so bad. Like I remember one time this was in high school and we were learning about the civil rights movement. And we're like, you know, we were, we always learn about like MLK, Rosa Parks. And I was like, well, I wanna bring in like a little bit of a different perspective. And when we talked about Rosa Parks, I told the teacher, I was like, hey, did you know that she wasn't the first black woman to not give up her seat? There are actually a lot of other, their stories aren't told is because of that concept of like, fitting like the like the the model minority image and like being a worthy victim and then he's like that's not true and then he moved on and just I feel like that happens a lot it's like your points are cut off and they're not seen as valid or it seems like oh you just want to bring up this perspective or I don't know it just it gets so frustrating to me because when teachers always try to do like how um Daniela was saying that it's kind of like it's seen as a side thing and when people treat it as a side thing it goes into like this realm of like almost like oh we only have stories of, like of oppression and we don't have stories of excellence we don't have stories of us being leaders we don't have stories of us like community organizing and we don't have stories where like we're doing great things we're only seen as like victims and that's all that we're ever going to be and even that in itself it gets degrading to only see yourself like oh, wow, yeah, well, I guess I'm only going to be like a migrant farm worker or this or that. But like when you actually get to hear these stories, like it becomes empowering and it becomes like the sense of like, there's so much I can do in my life. And I feel like it's so frustrating when you aren't taught those like perspectives. And I feel like I get that a lot with Prof. Johnny. And I love how like he always like validates anything that any of us say, because I feel like sometimes when I speak up in some of my classes, it's like, oh, OK, well, now on to the next student. And I don't know, I don't feel like I get that. Like, I feel like when I'm in Prof. Johnny's class, it's more dialogue than repetition. And I feel like when I'm in my other classes, it's more like, okay, well, this were, these were the key points of the reading. But I feel like it's more engaging in community and having like, how you said, just being together and healing together. Wow, that's super powerful, Marisa. I mean, what you're sharing about how, again, like how we could feel when, when um, faculty, when professors are only telling a single story of particular communities, and, and in this case, racially minoritized, like Black or Indigenous, Latinx or Chicano, in the Indigenous communities, for sure, there's always an oppression story. And there's truth in being able to say, these are systems operating uh, systematically against specific groups of people. But it's not a complete story. It's not the full story. There's so much knowledge and wisdom and um, and, and love and things that we know and, and are cultivated within our own communities and households that can be rich knowledge that can actually advance the disciplines if we let it into the classroom. And I value so much um, the leadership and the and the and the work that you're both doing and some and some and I, I say it with some hesitancy because I wish you didn't have that burden to do that work. You you should have the ability to just be a student, to be a learner, right? Um, and what you're saying, Brianna, is I have to do some of the institutions work because they're not doing it. And I wish you didn't, but I'm also grateful that you are because I know every time you show up, you open the door for three other people to show up, you know, um, and to be able to be in that space to see themselves in that space. So I hope one day that burden is shared and that the institution does more of what it needs to be doing. And I'm talking about all institutions, not specifically just, you know, DU, all, all institutions, including the University of Connecticut. But in the meantime, I'm really grateful for the work that you are doing, because it does make a difference and it has a huge impact um, in 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 the in the communities that you serve 
and the people that you build relationships with um, in the process. Wow, my heart is filled. Um, it aches and it's filled at the same time, like a lot of complex emotions. Um, and as we wrap up today's um, episode, I just wanna turn it back to, to uh, Johnny and Danielle for maybe some closing thoughts about what you just heard from Brianna and Marissa and just a conversation about what would you say um, to faculty to professors who want to do better they don't want to do the harm that we just heard about they want to do some of better work in their classrooms to be anti-racist um in, in their teaching well what given what you just heard today and also your own thinking what, what advice would you give to faculty who want to try this on or do you know to work towards this path or for those who have been doing this work and sometimes feel like Gosh, you know, how to sustain this? Maybe what advice would you give either way? You know, curious. I want to build off of uh, what Brianna and Marissa were just sharing because I think it's really powerful. And um, they're just reminding me again and again that this idea that we don't give students a voice, they already have it. And this assumption, you know, the ways that we position ourselves in relation to young people in relation to pre-service teachers, this hierarchy of knowledge, right? I think it's really important to just, it doesn't matter, so what? So I went to school 12 years after high school, like that doesn't, whatever, you know, that was my experience. You know, my dad tossed newspapers. Your mom was like a clerk for, you know, a, a pro, I, I can't remember what, you, you know, we all like come from these working class, many of us come from these working class families, but like, all of it is valuable. You know, all of these, like, th we need to throw out these deficit perspectives, which we say again and again and again, like, not seeing what people from um, lots of communities, especially historically disenfranchised communities, is not having knowledge or not, you know, not knowing things, you know, and and seeing ourselves and positioning ourselves in a manner that we're we're just going to deposit this knowledge into into students. I think it's really important to disrupt that. Um, if we're if we're really committed to um, these notions of like liberatory pedagogies and anti-racist teaching, and also that we can't do this work alone, I cannot do this alone. It's humbling. It requires a stance of vulnerability, and that anyone who wants to do this needs to make sure that they're you know calling on you know brothers and sisters in the struggle, you know, and building that community is so so crucial. I learned from my colleague, Grace Player, you know, we check in. I, I have some friends from UCLA urban schooling program who I'm really cool with. So Johnny, as soon as I was like, okay, of course, of course he's awesome. Um, you know, that I call on, I, there's young people that I still communicate with in Detroit. I think that, you know, there's, it's really important as we're continuing to learn and grow in this work to make sure we're open to learning from each other. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Daniel. That was beautiful. Like I echo everything that you shared. And I would and I would just say, like, in my experience, a kind of observation when I've seen some educators, whether they're kind of K through 12 teachers or even in higher education, that I think there just needs to be a real genuine desire to want to be able to really, like you were saying, activate students, their voices, their experiences. So I think one, it just it starts with that humble intention of wanting to do it. And then starting to look to potentially what resources that might be there to be able to do that, because we definitely need more community of educators that one check on each other's care, but that also could collectively come together to do some of the lifting like pedagogy, pedagogical lifting curriculum lifting, you know, share strategies on how to build and and I think one of the, the things that I think doing community work through the years is always kind of like school me on was a lot of times, sometimes a smart move is to build relationships with folks that are doing the work or that hold those identities or that have that experience and bring them in and honor them in. So I think a lot of this just has to happen with the agency that you first need to kind of engage in to want to do it versus saying, well, I can't do that. I hold all these identities a privilege. You know, I'm, you know, I might be white middle class. Well, I don't share this experience. Well, then like, yo, go, start going on your journey. Start plugging in, reach out to like a teacher of color, uh, uh, you know, group that does this work, uh, plug into like an ethnic studies campaign or something, you know, 
I think a lot of times it's it's about folks like getting past that. If you really want to do it, you've got to like now take the next step in your journey to go out there and make those and make those connections and 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 find that because I know that there's folks out there. I know at UConn that there's amazing folks like yourselves and other educational leaders that would be there to help you on that journey if you really wanted to do it. Well said, Johnny. Well said to really everybody. I'm, uh, I think Milagros and I are very thankful for today's conversation. So with that said, Danielle, Johnny, Brianna, Marisa, thank you so, so much for your vulnerability, for your willingness to share such wisdom about what liberatory education could be like when we center trust, authentic relationships, um, and are truly committed to communities as, as you express, Johnny. You're also inspirational, and we're so grateful for the leadership and education you're offering both inside and outside the classroom. So thank you so much. Um, keep fighting the fight, the good fight, and just remember, we're not alone. Since this is our last episode, we, Milagros and I, as well as Henry, who supported this podcast through his work as a student worker at the Office for Diversity and Inclusion at UConn, want to share some closing reflections. In thinking about all our episodes this season, my heart and soul is filled with what I learned about anti-racist teaching and not only about what it's against, which in this case is white settler coloniality and patriarchy in our teaching and learning environment and experiences, but also what this teaching is for. It is heart work that cares about students' full humanity. It is soul work that requires not only caring for students' souls, but also being educators whose souls are committed to liberatory praxis inside and outside of the classroom. This is not a temporary approach to teaching. It is a way of living and being as an educator. I also love the synergy between the episodes in terms of resources that are shared during the conversation. Anyone who wants to get a list of those resources, please visit cetl.ucon.edu and click on the banner for the Heart Podcast. Each episode has a transcript and a list of resources, and we hope that's helpful to you all. And lastly, I really enjoyed expanding my own view of what anti-racist teaching means and where it can happen. In episode two, Dr. Santos, Joseph, and Leva provided great examples of the necessity for identifying the levers of change that are needed in higher education and the work that anti-racist educators have in pulling those levers that they have access to. In episode three, Drs. Lori Pan Davis and Frank Tuitt showed us what it looks like to take an anti-racist teaching approach and stance into administrative work in higher education. And in episode five, Dr. Nien Hauser, Dr. Cantu, and Brown Lee showed us the collective work that is needed to make anti-racist teaching an organizational culture at community colleges. In episode seven, Danielle DeRosa and Dr. Varghese and Okello immersed us in the necessity to unclass the classroom, to disrupt normative views about the process of learning, and to create liberatory educational praxis. I can go on and on, honestly. I've learned a great deal and have lots of reflection ahead this summer. Again, I'm so thankful to all of our guests. Season one had a lot of highs and it provided a great introduction to many of the concepts and practices that are utilized within anti-racist teaching. There are also many moments for self-reflection, such as when Dr. Funk discusses centralizing language and ideas that are solution-oriented rather than problem-oriented. He offered meaningful guidance on how discussions should be framed when he elaborates on the difference between being anti-something and pro-something. Wisdom of this nature was common through many episodes in the season. It provided learning moments for us as well as for any practitioners interested in fine-tuning their strategies. I particularly loved how various conversations, either intentionally or unintentionally, recognized that higher education and anti-racist teaching is not unique to the university. Within the theme of higher education, there were more specific discussions that touched on anti-racism in community colleges, like our episode 6 theme did, or on the development of students up until they reach higher ed, like Dr. Player mentions on episode 4, while discussing education's inherently political nature through all levels. Season 1 provided a glimpse of the sheer vastness that intersectionality and anti-racist teaching has to offer scholars, activists, and students. Two common themes stuck out throughout the episodes, urgency and love. Urgency regarding this issue because of the lack of uniformity that it brings about, 
which yields students feeling the resistance in their efforts to make the world a more equitable place. In addition, there is an incredible amount of love that's shared among the professors that we interviewed. Professors and scholars value the humanity of the past, the present, and the future of their students, which allows them to approach their curriculum in a more wholesome way. We even had the opportunity to hear from undergraduates who were directly impacted by one of their professors and the results speak for themselves. The students were beyond appreciative of the support their professor provided them with, and they were also learning from his leadership by being student activists at the University of Denver campus. Sandy and Chris touched on the elements of analyzing oneself in relation to others, asking ourselves, who are my people? They emphasize the importance of being better relatives to each other and asking ourselves what's at stake if we don't embark on certain endeavors right now, such as climate change. Danielle and Johnny reminded us that building trust with community members takes time and that there is power in the journey of building capacity for change in students and their families. In conclusion, we hope that you learned just as much as we did. Get ready for an upcoming season filled with fascinating speakers and topics that touch on anti-racist teaching in specific disciplines and the gaps that exist within. We are grateful to the many teams at the University of Connecticut that supported us this semester in creating this podcast. We truly could not have done it without them. These teams include the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, the Office for Diversity and Inclusion, Also, the team at UConn 360, thank you so much. We're also so grateful to our guests um, who participated in the first season. We learned so much from you. You inspired us. You're incredible teachers, and we hope all of you have learned from them as well. We're grateful. Thank you all so much because it takes a village and it takes heart. We'll see you at season two in the fall of 2021.